Hi, everyone. My name is Salmaz, and I work for uh, Shopify. Uh, as uh, Arsalan mentioned, it's a catchy title. Uh, I'm going to talk about finding shoe stores in more than 100K merchants, or actually how to use Spark to group all things. <coughs> so I'm currently doing uh, finance data in Shopify, but in my previous life, I was doing finance and some uh, playing with bioinformatics and cancer data. And like the, the main theme of my talk and whatever I've done is this sort of curiosity in like what the data is saying and following that. So I'll talk about uh, finding a needle in haystack or finding like specific kind of stores in uh, um, so many merchants and also how we try all sorts of wrong tools for doing it and during the way we do the course correction to get the correct answers. And also uh, how to have fun during the process. So as an analyst, I'm really more interested in getting the results than like the beauty of a code or something. And uh, one of the things I've seen really nice with Spark is that it enables me to not care about what's happening underlying the data and just uh, help with getting the results. So a bit about the Shopify. Um, Shopify is a commerce platform. It started as an e-commerce, but now it uh, handles retail and, um, and online and mobile everywhere. Uh, it's not a marketplace. It's actually a home for people's brands. So you can uh, go to Shopify.com, try to start a store, and you can sell all sorts of products. Uh, you might have gone to many Shopify stores and not know it's a Shopify, because uh, we give people the freedom to do their own sort of uh, look and feel, and we don't put any limitations in the products, number of things they can list, so on and so forth. So I started about a year ago at Shopify. And every day, the data team sends out this email that's titled uh, Yesterday's Trending Store. So we send out the uh, products and stores that had a particularly high sale uh, the day before. And it's really nice to see like, the things that our merchants are creating. Most of the times, they are, they are people who are starting a business. They're entrepreneurs or mercators. And the products are kind of cool to have. And uh, more often than not, you would see people around the office walking with like a cool shirt or a very nice skateboard. And they say, oh, yeah, I got it from uh, one of those top uh, trending stores. So I wanted to also find something that I like and buy from our merchants and sort of like contribute to this pool. Um, and when I say something, I was really actually looking for shoes. They're like my biggest passion. And I'm always looking for finding cool and neat shoes. I used to work in Times Square. And uh, I would make sure that every time that I have a like, uh, particularly boring day or a very tiring day, I would walk by 34th Street and I can look at all the shoe stores and that would make me happy. Um, so unfortunately, last year, when I was looking, none of these uh, shiny shoes were showing up in the trending uh, uh, stores email. So it kind of like started this interest in me. Like, uh, would I be able to find uh, shoe stores? Or in general, would I be able to have uh, some sort of uh, pipeline that would enable me find uh, stores that sell a particular kind of product. So I started looking more into Shopify stores and I learned a lot about our data. So first thing I noticed is that if I go to the first homepage of uh, one of our top stores, I would see that they're selling things like posters, mugs, t-shirts. So it's not a single kind of product. They have really the freedom to list uh, different kinds of products. So that to me meant that if I wanted to look for a certain kind of product, I should actually move from looking at the store level and look at the product level, which had obviously multiplies the number of things I have to look at a lot. The second thing was that we give this sort of freedom of speech to people to describe the product however they want. So when you look at this picture, you obviously see a shirt. But when you start looking through the description, it says, you like pineapples? Well, how you like them? Pineapples. A whole hell of a lot. And like, if I continue reading through this description, it's only at the end of second paragraph that I would see the word shirt. So even just reading the description and getting the frequency of the words, it's not going to be very useful in this case. I'm going to have six or seven hits for pineapple and one for the shirt. So it's going to be automatically filtered out. Um, there's lots of products listed. So uh, we have like more than 150 merchants right now, and 150K merchants. And there were like 60 million products listed. So Obviously, Ottawa, the capital of Canada, uh, has 900,000 people. So it means like if we wanted to give each person in Ottawa a, uh, something from a Shopify store, they would end up with 67 products. The other thing is there's so much text to process. When you combine together the product description, product name, and vendor, it ends up being, uh, for all of these products, equal to reading the Harry Potter series 7,400 times front to back. So obviously, there's no, like, there's no way humans can go through this and process it. So we have to come up with cool sorts of uh, technologies. Um, with all of that in mind, I uh, started an, uh, like a meetup inside the Shopify. And I sent an email that said, hey, are you guys interested in doing some sort of product mining? Let's start with shoes. 
And then like 10 or 15 people responded and we all got together and uh, we started working on this as a pet project. So first step was to use our existing Vertica data warehouse and uh, try to find the tables and the sources of the information. So we started with very simple queries, select star from Shopify products where the title is similar to shoes. Or we thought we can go even fancier and say, okay, give me the stores, uh, store names where in their product they have shoes. And uh, we made a page and we were so excited and it was really fun for about 10 minutes. Because what happened afterwards was that while we were trying to do this thing uh, on our data warehouse, uh, we had actually managed to bring down the warehouse. All of us were trying to hit this sort of non-distributed data uh, at the same time. There was also not enough processing power. So even by the time that like, some of our queries got into the pool and we got the responses, uh, it would keep timing up for the other people. Also, the filters I showed you about how there should be shoes in the description or in the title are not very smart. And SQL was not really particularly known for being good in textual analysis. Uh, one of the top hits I got was uh, the picture of mother tying baby's shoelaces. So it's by no means a shoe product. Um, the other problem was like, so in cases of learning and uh, classifying, it's good if you have some samples to train on. But we didn't have any good examples of shoe stores or uh, classified products to say, okay, this is what it's gonna look like, so try and find these things that are similar to this with me, for me. So as, as I said, it was a pet project at that point in time, and we said, okay, we're gonna put it aside. We were moving to better sort of infrastructure for our data. Um, but as I was passionate about this, I had talked to other people about it. So at one point, I get this email from someone in the exec team saying, can you create a white list of eligible stores for collaboration with Pinterest, stores not selling ammunition, adult material, cigarettes, etc." It keeps timing out for me, but here is a SQL query that you need to run. So we have this sort of open data policy that everyone is able to query against our data warehouse and get their results, but there is this like sort of mixed uh, blessing or misfortune that the people in data team have higher uh, timeouts for their queries. So, so many times people send us uh, SQL and say, hey, it's timing out for me, can you try? And most of the time they're doing something wrong. So, this is the query they had sent me. And uh, <laughs> believe me, there is more. It's just there's no room to show it. So, it says, give me the shop domains from our customers joining products, so all these like massive tables, where the description, not like ammunition, not like cigarettes, not like this, and the list goes on. So, I tried running this. And this is what the next week of my life looked like. <laughs> so it kept timing off. Um, and sometimes I was like, okay, I'm smart. I'm gonna be up uh, very early in the morning and run this when nobody else is using the uh, database. So I would try to, I would start working, but then it would kill all the nightly and hourly ETL jobs. And at the end it wouldn't return any results or it would just time out at the last second. The worst thing about it was, so this thing kept happening for a few days. So our data engineering guys would be like, who's running that drug query? Or like, someone, why are you looking for all those drugs? So it's not a very good reputation to go by. Um, while we were going through all this pain, we actually got lucky and uh, the infrastructure moved to the new system. So instead of having all our data in the central Vertica data warehouse, we had moved uh, our data to the Hadoop uh, distributed file system. And also, we had adopted Spark. So our cluster was set up, kudos to our engineering guys, um, everything was ready and we had decided that we we're gonna start using the Python um, API of Spark. So one thing that really made it easy for us, uh, for me as an analyst was like, okay, the data is now distributed, it's gonna be in different locations, but as a user, I don't have to care about it. If I go to Hadoop and do fs-ls, I would still see the files as I know them. I wouldn't see the individual part files. So that makes thinking about the data much easier. The other thing is like, uh, the distributed computing, the things I wanted to do were very easily uh, distributable. I could send basically a copy of the code to each node and say, okay, what you're doing is parallelizable, so run the piece of code on the section of data that you have and then send it back to uh, me with this logic and combine them. It was really easy to get started with. And uh, so that ugly SQL query became five lines of code. The first line I'm asking, I'm telling it like, this is the location of the data that you need to load I had made a function saying, does it have blacklisted words or not? And then if it does, give me the description and do a collect. So like literally, if my computer was just a single horse running it, running it on Spark was like an array of horses. I can get results faster that I could write test case for that one method I had. 
So that was really amazing. It was just like, okay, finally we have some answers. And I remember I was so excited. I logged into our uh, chat room and I was uh, almost screaming to all the engineers that this is working, this is working. Um, so it was all good. So I started looking at the results. Um, I had, out of the 100,000 stores, I had got 30,000 of them filtered. And that somehow sounded wrong. Like I knew the platform, I knew kind of the stores we had, and there was no way that there was 30,000 of them that would be blacklisted. So I started looking at some samples of the data that they filtered. Uh, one of the top ones I saw is this short. So I look at it, there's nothing wrong with it. It's okay for Pinterest to sell that. But in the description it says, the box shots, the words first ammunition for your thighs. So obviously the word ammunition is gonna filter this pair of shorts. Um, and it's sort of a like, known problem. Like uh, As humans, we would look at this short and we, we are able to put context around the information, but for machines, it's not that easy to put that context. And it's like, okay, I have one rule and that's this word. So if it uh, passes this uh, rule, I'm gonna show it. But uh, luckily, we are at the age of internet, so we can ask strangers on the internet to do all sorts of things for us. Uh, mechanical Torque from Amazon uh, was what we started using. So it's a crowdsourcing internet marketplace. So basically, you go in there, you define some sort of tasks that are easier for humans to do and are not very difficult. Like it's not very challenging to do, but still it's difficult for machines. So classical examples are classification or uh, sentiment analysis. Like if you show a tweet to someone, uh, it's very hard for, for a machine to know if it's uh, sort of sarcastic or not, but for humans, it's very uh, easy to understand, and data cleaning. Uh, so we decided to set up mechanical torque. So we would show the images of uh, four top selling products of the stores to these mechanical torques. And uh, we, would, we had like a preset of uh, categories that the shops could belong to, and we allowed people to uh, select multiple categories. So I want to actually show you this because it's pretty simple to set up. So you go to, uh, as a requester, like you are requesting the work, and you go to uh, Amazon Mechanical Torque.com. And what you do is like you design basically a sample HTML page, and here it would be like the images of the four top selling products, and they're uh, allowed to select multiple categories. Now why did we do that? Because so many times, as I said, the store is not selling only one kind of product, so I want to have that sort of weighted information about what kind of products they sell. The other thing we did was to sort of minimize the chance of getting uh, skewed by one turker. So imagine if I'm showing a picture to someone and for some reason, although this is a picture of a toy, they think it's a picture of a um, sport equipment. So if I'm only looking at answers of one person, I'm gonna be totally wrong by taking that. So what we did is we asked four different turkers to look at the same set of images and we got the results from all of them. So Amazon sends you this information in a very clean CSV, like within 24 hours. So it's a bidding mechanism, so you have to like uh, incentivize people to answer these questions. Uh, but we got it for like three cents a question, so it's very, very small uh, amount of money. Um, so we have something like the shop ID, which for us was the identifier of the shop we had sent them, and then the list of categories. So the answers came back as like, um, for this shop, some people thought it was books, some people thought it was toys, and when you look at the pictures uh, of the same store, it's like a children's publishing store. So you can see that these look like books, but also they can be toys for kids. So I can understand why two people had given weight to the toys. But at the end of the day, we wanted to sort of summarize this and deal with like one single row for the shop so that the process would be easier. So we did a very simple thing. We said, let's uh, count the votes, the total votes that we have got. So for this shop, we got five votes in total. Uh, two of them from toys and three of them from books. So for this shop, we have 60% uh, chance of being a bookstore and 40% chance of being a toy store. Similar logic for uh, other stores. So here again, we have like a stationary store um, merchant and then some people thought they were selling art supplies and some people thought they were uh, doing office supplies. So one thing you have to keep in mind is that these turkers would uh, obviously want to do the minimal work and get the reward of answer. So what we did was we went in and s randomly selected 100 of these shops and went through the process and tried to uh, give the values of the categories ourselves. And we got around like 70 to 75% accuracy. So it was okay for that stage of work and we continued with it. Um, so again, 
pulling this data into a, like it, it came in a CSV, so I could put, uh, put it on the GFS, read it into Spark, and again, I could have like a very simple method that would say, is the count of blacklisted words in this thing more than the median that we are expecting for a filtered store? And if, if it's true, then go and look at the category that the Turkers brought for this. And for some stuff, we were more sensitive, like, okay, if uh, the top category is adult, for sure filter it, but also if the score of the adult is more than 50%, still go and filter it. We tuned this function a bit more for the final result, and that was awesome, because from 30K uh, stores, we got to 10K <laughs> filtered out, and we could pass like 90,000 of our stores to Pinterest, and the deal went live, and uh, everyone was happy, really, by getting the results in a very short time period. So everyone got what they wanted, but still, as part of the data team, I was like, I'm sure I can look for more things in this data, and also, I still haven't got the answer to, like, where are the shoe stores? So I thought, okay, maybe drilling down into one product, it's not that easy, but maybe I can find similar stores. And, like, for us as humans, clustering is very easy. We do it without even noticing. If anyone walks into this room and I ask them, can you put these balls on the left-hand side uh, in sort of groups that are, they are more similar to each other, they will probably come up with the same thing that I have on the right-hand side. But uh, because I have mentioned the color, so it's a feature that you know you have to look for. Uh, what I did was I used the Turker data the same way. I said, okay, these uh, 17 or 18 categories that we have for each shop are the features that you can look into. So then uh, it became a matrix of like 100K stores by 18, and we run clustering on it. Now, I had tried clustering before Spark uh, using scikit-learn. I was taking so much time that I only did it for a single category, and even like that took like overnight on my computer. But with Spark, uh, MLlib, it was pretty easy, and in fact, uh, this is like right out of the API doc, but the code that I ran on my machine is not very different. The only difference, it was actually to Manja data, so it's in a format that uh, Spark and MLlib can uh, look at. So it's the k-means, uh, we did some stuff for finding the optimal k, like the elbow method where you look at the error decreasing, and uh, we've got very interesting clusters. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> there was not many jobs running on production, so I went kind of crazy and I used like all 400 cores we had. So it was really uh, instant gratification. You would run, change the k-means, and you would see the results within seconds. Uh, right now, I can't do it anymore. Because <laughs> they would kick me out. Um, but we found some really interesting clusters. So here, specifically, I'm showing the cluster of all coffee shops. But if you look at the name of the shops, like in Valsa or uh, Groundwork, Brooklyn, and Beanberry, there is no coffee in the name of the stores. So these. Uh, the shops in this uh, cluster all had some score for food and all had some score for art. So that's like they're capturing the artsy and sort of hipster nature of this shop. But it's very interesting because we have sort of crowdsourced this, uh, gathering this information without having to look at it ourselves. So another thing is like uh, everyone is interested is to know how they compare to their peers. Uh, LinkedIn has started doing that. So if you go to your uh, profile, you would see like within your network, uh, for the past little while how you've been doing. So we can provide the same sort of information to our merchants. Um, as a small business owner, it would be very interesting to know like, okay, I'm doing very slow sales this week, but also other people in my category are doing the same. So that's what we did. In like a sample product study, we sent some emails to a selected few merchants and we could tell them, hey, compared to others in your industry, that's how you were doing, like were you in the top 1% of the sales or top 1% of the orders? And uh, we paired this with sort of like more personalized advice. So the response we got was very positive. The other thing is, so this came out of like a fun uh, data chasing uh, project we did. But so many times now, internal developers uh, write to us and say, hey, can you tell me, uh, can you give me a bunch of stores that are good in apparel and accessories because I want to develop this feature that would be useful to them and I wanted to test on it. So like out of nowhere, we have now this pipeline that can give us information that we didn't have beforehand. So also I finally bought some shoes from <laughs> the top shoe clusters. Um, okay, I corrected this, so lessons learned. Um, if you need data, then, uh, and it's hard to get, it's hard to uh, get it out of the data you have, uh, you can try uh, using mechanical torques or crowdsourcing uh, what you need. There's also other services now that provide the same uh, sort of services as Amazon, and it's not that expensive. 
Also, if you need the processing power, Spark is really easy to do the simple things with. Like once you get into tuning the jobs and getting uh, memory performance things, then it can come hard. But for just doing sort of quick analysis and getting a response, it's very good. Also, find issues, send a PR to projects. So at some point, uh, when I was trying the MLlib, I uh, tried one of the examples and actually it was very. It was like a year ago, and there was a problem with the example. So. I, I made a PR, I didn't make it because someone before me fixed it, but it was, it's really nice to see the code and the community developing so fast. Also have fun, like uh, for me, the main thing that drove this project was the fun I had using the tools that was available to me. Uh, that's all, any questions? All right, questions? Amen. Nobody wants to be the first person to ask questions, right? So, um, okay, I, I will, just to get started, we'll ask you the question, I, same I asked Hassam. You, you seem to have gotten started. You liked a lot of the things about MLlib and so forth. What was kind of hard? What would you put on your wish list? Like, this is what I would like to see kind of like Spark do in the next three or six months that would make these types of things easier for people who come after you. Uh, so the pipelines actually that they're talking about and this morning, it was really interesting because most of the time sp uh, gets spent on munging the data, making sure that it agrees with the format that these libraries are gonna expect. Yeah. And also to have that sort of flow of information that you don't jump from one process of like cleaning the data and then getting it to run through the ML. I guess that's uh, something I would really like uh, to start using in Spark. But in terms of like uh, our ETL that we are building on top of Spark, yeah. uh, memory tuning has been uh, an issue, it's like having better documentation and information around how to set like different worker memories and uh, Spark memory options would be really good. Got it? Okay. Yeah. Hi there. Um, I was wondering how you dealt with stores that have um, a wide range of SKUs that they sell. Uh, so like they, they belong to different categories? Yeah. Um, so th there's always gonna be ties. Uh, so for the ones that have like low scores and everything, they obviously don't have a category of their own, but then there's a category of the stores that we can't say what they sell. So they sort of form their own cluster in that sense. Anything else? No, all right, everybody wants to go to the Exo Hall. Okay, so I think there is the last talk uh, of the day. Everybody can go uh, to the Expo Hall for kind of the reception and maybe uh, one more round of applause uh, for someone else.